presentation number 902. <coughs> says amen. It's so good to be here this morning. To good, good to be in the presence of all of our brothers and sisters in Christ today. If you're visiting with us, uh, you are our honored guest here. and We want you to know that uh, we are cherishing your visit with us on this morning. Please, before you leave, allow us to uh, get to know you a little bit better on today. This morning, as we uh, look into the book of Ephesians, uh, this month, all of our lessons have come out of the book of Ephesians. Today, uh, we're going to be looking at new attitudes, new attitudes, and we're going to be taking a look into a small portion of Paul's letters to the Ephesian church. This, this letter is somewhat different than some of Paul's other writings. Uh, the book of Ephesians has three main themes. One, the believer's position through grace. Number two, the truth concerning the body of Christ. Number three, the walk according with our position in the body of Christ. How can we as members of the church beat this sin that is destroying our new self. Some people think they can do it on their own. Some think that they have never done anything that would be considered sin in the first place. Here's what Paul says on that topic in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And then he continues in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, he says, For all have sinned, not y'all have sinned, amen. amen. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, uh, in my sinful nature, uh, if we don't think that we have a sinful nature, we need to stop where we are, take a better look in the mirror, because I have some bad news for you today. We all have sinned. Amen. We all are in need of the grace of God today. So how do we ditch this old self and the sin that brings along with it? Here comes the best part. I wish I could save it for last, but Jesus took care of our sin on the cross. Amen. Amen. Let me repeat that again. Our sin, my sin, your sins died on the cross of Calvary with Jesus. Isn't it amazing how much God loves us? He loves us so much that he sent his son to die for the sins of mankind. Some people have a hard time with this concept, but this is what the gospel message is all about. And as Christians, we are to be dead to sin and alive to God. Okay, now that we've got that all straight, that we have been sinners, that we know our sin died with Jesus on the cross, and Jesus took care of that, how do I still get rid of this sinful nature? How do I get rid of the old me? Isaiah tells us in chapter 64, verse 6, but we all are as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Our old self, the old me, is an unclean thing. 
It's a filthy rag. On my best day, I'm still a filthy rag. And there is only one way to become clean again, and that is through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 23 tells us that our hearts and our minds must be made new. This one verse of scripture really says a lot. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Uh, let's see what it is that needs to take place to have our hearts and our minds to be made new again. The first part of this change that we need to take is pretty dramatic. We have to change our thought process. We all have to do 180s in our life. We have to have new attitudes. And Paul urged the early Christians to replace their old sinful, natural respondents to difficulties with new attitudes. He wrote, put off, put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind. And then he says, put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The following today, the rest of the lesson is going to be dealing with what can I change? How can I replace negatives with positives? And by knowing and believing and practicing these attitudes, you will demonstrate that you are more than a conqueror through the one who loves you, and that is Jesus Christ. What are the following guidelines? One, see, our outlook determines our outcome. If my outlook is positive, then my outcome will be positive. If my outlook is negative, then my outcome would be negative. Confucius said this, the person who says I can and the person who says I can't, they're both right. Amen. They're both right because if I say I can, I will. But if I say I won't, then I won't. But as Christians, we need to be practicing new attitudes. The first thing is that we need to replace evil with good. If I spell evil, E-V-I-L, and I reverse that, it's L-I-V-E. Evil is the reverse of the right way to live. So what do I need to do, preacher? I need to replace evil with good. Be not overcome with evil. See, it's easy for us <laughs> if someone does something to me. I want to do something to them back. <laughs> right? But that's not the Christian way to live, right? And we can get caught up in the world and be caught up in the way that the world do, does things that as Christians we have to think twice. In, in James we talk about being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Right? So uh, uh, as we go throughout our daily walk, uh, you know, people can get rude and nasty, but that doesn't mean that we get rude and nasty back. Right? It's easy to, if we're all honest with ourselves, it's easy to, but Paul says, replace evil with good. People who are able to utilize the power of God and the Holy Spirit that lives in you with all of their relationships and their thinking and their activities will form a basis of healthy living, but it takes practice. Amen. Practice makes perfect, right? So I need to replace evil with good. Then I need to replace worry. Some of us are worrying, and Jesus says, why are we worrying? We don't need to be worrying as Christians. We need to replace our worry with faith. He says, do not be anxious about anything or worried about anything, but in prayer. And petitions with thanksgiving present your request to God. We need to be people of faith. We need to pray to God. And after we pray to God, we need to give it over to him. Sometimes we'll get on our knees and pray. Uh, we sing this song that, you know, I grew up singing in church. Uh, Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. And we'll bring our burdens to the Lord and we'll pray for them. And then we'll take them right back with us. That's not what God wants from us. 
Right? He wants us to replace worry with faith. Do not get upset when things do not go your way, realizing that God, what he could do is he could take your disappointments to develop in us greater godliness. We're looking at them as disappointments, but sometimes God will use things in our life to help develop our faith. And then we need to replace despair with hope. David said, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, are, uh, on the, uh, are, are on those who reverence him. When we look at the word fear in the Bible, I don't want you to think about being scared. I want you to think about having a reverence for God. On those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Hope in God. See, in our human way of thinking, we rely so much on ourselves. We rely so much on our thinking, on what I can do, me, myself, and I. Sometimes we become self-centered. When as a Christian, we have to do, uh, we have to reverse our thinking, right? Uh, uh, we have to say, Lord, you are now ruler and reigner of my life, and I'm going to put all my hope, all my trust, and all my faith in you. So when we replace despair, when things are in, a, in, in despair, we need to replace that. Our, our attitudes have to change. We need to replace that with hope. And we need to replace anger with love. Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 says, I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger and abounding in love. See, love is patient and kind. When we think about, you know, uh, being angry, it's okay to be angry, but uh, the Bible says be angry in what? Sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So when I have anger in my heart, I need to replace that. That gives me a new attitude. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It's not envious. It's not boastful. It's not proud or haughty or selfish or rude. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And then we need to replace suspicion with trust. Amen. Solomon in Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It is amazing what God can do with people who love him. And it's amazing what God can do with people who trust him. Love and trust breeds an environment of multiplication of his kingdom and his righteousness. People who know that they are loved and trustworthy can accomplish anything with the help of Christ, who gives them strength and power. I don't know if you believe that today, but I believe that when I put my trust in God, the word trust paints a picture of me putting all of my weight on and just letting him know that he will take care of me. And we need to replace cynicism with belief. We live in a very cynical and skeptical world. Abraham did too, but it was written of him. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith and gave God glory, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he has promised. Listen, there are over 31,000 promises in the word of God, and not a one of them has been broken. So when we think about our work, walk as a Christian, and the new attitudes that we need to have, we need to be putting off the old self, and we need to be replacing them. Part of our faith walk as a Christian is to believe, right? And then we need to replace sorrow with joy. Paul wrote, I am sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing all things. We need to take an inventory of the great things. A lot of times we are looking at what we don't have. But we ought to be taking an inventory of thinking about what has God done for me through Christ? Amen. And what has God even done for you in a physical manner? All you have to do is just sit back 
and count your blessings. Count them one by one. Count your blessings to see what God has done. It's always someone who has it worse than you think you have. Amen. 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 We need to replace gloom with cheerfulness. Paul wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Happiness is a choice that requires determination to be happy about what's happening at the moment. Joy says, I'm going to be joyful no matter what the circumstances are. Shout to the Lord and let all the earth sing power and majesty, praise to the King. The joy of the Lord is our ever foundation of strength. We need to place anxiety with security. Job said in Job chapter 31, he says, For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor, I could do no such thing. For I have put my trust in gold, nor said to the pure gold, you are my security. See, we need to replace having our security in things. And we need to place our security in Christ. Amen. If we just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says all these things will be added unto you. If we just take note of that principle there, it's sowing and reaping. Whatever we sow, we got to reap back, right? But I can't reap nothing that I haven't sown. I can't say I want a bushel of corn and I haven't even planted a seed, Amen. right? Giving to God and having security in Christ says that I'm going to trust God, that uh, I'm going to give him the very best that I have. God requires three things from us. He wants us to give him three things, time, talent, and treasures. How much time do we give him? How much of our gifts and our talents we're going to be held in account for not using the gift that God has given us. Paul says in Philippians, my God shall supply all you need. Do we believe that today? My God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. So we need to replace that anxiety with security. And then we need to replace distress with confidence. We should be confident, you know, as Christians, we should be the ones holding our heads high because we have something that the world doesn't have. Amen. We have Jesus Christ by our side. He says, I praise you, Lord, for giving me your sense of certainty, for you have been my hope, O oh, sovereign God, my confidence since my youth. We have to be confident in his mighty power. We have to be confident in his plan and his sovereignty will for our lives. He works in ways. See, God is working. He's already at the end of where we're trying to be. He's just waiting for us to get there. Right? And so we need to replace this distress that we're having. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. I don't know what's going to happen. God already knows the end. And when we get there, we'll be like, oh, this is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Why? Because we need to be putting our confidence and our hope and our trust and our faith in the Lord. Be confident in that. He will make a way for you. Things look foggy. Things look bleak. I don't know what's going to happen from day to day. You're not supposed to know. All you are supposed to do is trust in God. Amen. Amen. And we need to replace jealousy with contentment. For I have learned to be content, Paul says. In whatever circumstances I am in, he says, I can do everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ, who gives me the power and the strength. I shouldn't be looking at what everyone else has and being jealous and envious of that. I need to be content with what I have. God blessed me with what I have. If he wants to give me more, he will navigate the circumstances of my life to give me more. Amen. And then I need to replace defamation with inspiration. 
He says, whatever is true, whatever is pure, when we think about uh, saying something about someone else, we need to be thinking about the words of Christ, right? We need to be thinking about the words of Paul. The only way I should be looking down on anyone is that I'm reaching my hand to them to lift them back up. I should not be defaming anyone's name. He said, Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Amen. When you try to put down uh, uh, people and overpower them, we should be thinking about, yes, I can overpower them, not in the negative sense, but how can I inspire someone to be great? How can I inspire someone to be powerful? How can I inspire someone through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit? And then, with this concept of new attitudes, I need to replace attacks with prayers. Casting all of your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. In James 5.16, a scripture I like to quote on a weekly basis, he says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that ye may be healed. The uh, prayers of the righteous avails much. Amen. You have not because you ask not. Don't be in attack mode when you haven't even uh, uh, asked God for anything in prayer for yourself. Do not take vengeance into your own hands, but leave room for the wrath of God. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Pray for your enemies. Tell your adversaries. When someone is mistreating you, I want you to try this and see the type of response that you will get from somebody. Just tell the person that has been uh, your adversary, the person that has been in, in, in getting on your last nerve. Amen. There are people like that in this world. Amen. Amen. Uh, 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 that will try you, right? And just turn around and say to them, I'm going to pray for you. Amen. And see what type of response you'll get. That's the new attitude. See, it's easy for us to attack back when we are being attacked. But God does not want us to have that attitude like the world. We have to do a 180. And when I do a 180, I'm going in the opposite direction. Now, if I do a 360, I'm right back where I started. And as a Christian, we need to be doing 180s in our lives. And we need, to, we need to replace confusion with wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously. If you get in that word, Paul talks about the concept of studying to show yourself approved of God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So many people are confused in this world because they have not asked God for wisdom. Amen. They have not gotten into their word and studied it, right? If I took a Bible and if I took a song book today that has been sitting on this bench for a year or two years, there's going to be dust that accumulated on it because of it sitting. If I don't open my Bible, it accumulates dust. And dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. Amen. Why? Because if I'm not opening it, and, and reading it and studying it and practicing it, how can I get the principles from it? I'm confused in this world. People can tell me anything and I'll believe it. Why? Because I have not properly studied the Word of God. And I need to be changing my fleshly attitudes with spirit-led thoughts. We are spirit, body. Uh, we are spirit, soul, and body. That's our makeup. Some people will say, well, brother, being I the body with the soul and spirit. No, that's not incorrect. That is incorrect, brethren. You are spirit first. Because when you die, what happens? Your body will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit is going to go back to God who gave it. So my life, my, my thoughts form my life. Right? And so my life and my thoughts and my ways and my actions 
should be spirit led and, and our nature. And that's why Paul says, put off the old self, is that the old self says, look out for you. Do you? But my new attitude says that I need to replace those fleshly attitudes with spirit led thoughts. Make a choice today to be led by the spirit and you will succumb these fleshly desires. Lord, it's just, I, I get such good sleep on Saturday night. It's, it's hard to wake up and come to worship service on Sunday morning. That's a fleshly led thought. Amen. The spirit says, the church house is where I meet my brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is where we come together to worship God. And I'm going to be here. I don't care how tired I am. I'm going to get up and I'm going to make a conscious effort to be where my brothers and sisters are. That's the new attitude that we have to have. Amen. I need to replace error with truth. There's so much that's going on in our world today that... Uh, uh, that is not aligning with the word of God. It's error. And Jesus says you err because you do not know the scripture nor the power of God. Learn how to know. Learn how to obey and love the truth that is found in scripture. See, everything that you want to know should follow the amen principle. What is that? There's an answer. If you have a Bible question, God will give you an answer. The M in that is that there's a mate to that. More than likely, what you're asking a question about, there's more than one scripture that talks about it. And then the E is the example of it. You will find an example. Precept, example, or it's inferred. And then you have to make a choice. When we call this uh, uh, we call this the power of choice, right? You're either going to accept it or to reject it. But the truth is found in the Word of God. Our new self is a believer in Christ. It's a new self. It's a new creation. This is a very important point that I want you to get today. Old self should be dead. Remember, old self was crucified with Christ. New self has a new life and is created in the likeness of God. And we ought to lead a life that is selfless. When I see Christians who are self-centered and selfish, then I know that they, we have to do some praying, right? Because uh, the old man is still alive. We are also supposed to live a life that is holy, putting God in his proper place in our life. See, there are things in my life that are important. There are things that are more important. But the most important thing in my life is my relationship with my God. That is, that is what settles everything. When I look to God for my help and my help and my strength and my decision making, he will make sure that everything aligns with us. That is why God created us to worship him. And we just don't worship on Sunday. We worship God every day of the week. Amen. And when God is the center of our attention, life just seems to make more sense. In a chaotic world, when things are going on around us that are just crazy, I'm at peace. Because I know who's in control. Amen. God is in control. And when we begin to see life from this perspective, it takes on a whole new meaning. So which self are you today? Are you still the old self? You need to find the saving grace of Jesus Christ today by becoming a member or, or, or renewing your commitment with Jesus on today. If you are the new self, you need to find those uh, who are still walking around in the old man and help them to find their new self. Ephesians chapter 4, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. Everything starts in your mind. And to put on the new self, created to be like God 
in true righteousness and holiness. That is the way, brothers and sisters, that we put on these new attitudes. Verse 24, as I put on the new man, as I am renewed in the spirit of my mind, I begin to even look like God in my actions and in my attitude. Amen. I begin to think and I begin to act like God thinks and act. See, God did not just save us just to save us. He saved us to sanctify us. Amen. Sometimes we're spared of that word in the church of Christ. But sanctification is a, is a part of who we are. Right? Sanctified. What does that mean? That means I am set apart. When I decide to give my life to Christ, I am now set apart. To do a purpose for the living God. And when I begin to think and act like God thinks, with the results that my life becomes, it will be characterized by righteousness. It will be characterized by holiness. And to put it in simple terms, when my mind is renewed, I start to become more and more and more like Jesus. When people see us, they ought to see Jesus. People ought to walk up to you and say, are you Jesus? Why should they say that? Because your actions and your attitudes, your lifestyle is reflective of the attributes and the characteristics of Jesus. Our Christianity every day, Paul says that we ought to be uh, renewing every day. The more that we live, the more and more the old man should be coming on and the new man should be looking like Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Take Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, and read that in your personal time with the Lord on this week. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want to give you the plan of salvation right now. You, you become a Christian by hearing the word. I've just given you a snippet from the word of God today. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you are a candidate for baptism, even right now. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Again, this concept of new attitudes is a concept of repentance because we are doing 180s in our life. Okay. Repentance says, no sin, yes to God. No in my ways and yes to the ways of God. That's repentance. Repentance says no and then yes. It's that simple. It's not complicated. Little children can understand this principle. Sometimes in our world, we make things more complicated, and it's, and it's all about surrendering to the will of God. Will you stand before this wonderful audience and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you do that today, we'll baptize you for the remission of your sins. Baptism, I cannot reiterate it enough, is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what we preach. Every time we get a chance to tell people about the word of God, we are preaching about the gospel. This is the gospel message today. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. You reenact that in your obedience to that. How? You die. <coughs> we talked about putting off the old self. When you are buried, that is your death. When you come up out of the water, that is your resurrection. That is your new life in Christ. That's how you become a Christian. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, Romans 6, 1 through 4, Galatians 3, 27, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And if you stand in a need of prayer today, some of us, we hold things in and we hold them in for weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years. When all you have to do is ask the church for prayer, a lot of your burdens could be lifted by the prayers of the saints. 
Amen. James says the effectual, fervent, or the energetic, passionate prayers of the righteous avails much. Amen. I know that I stand before you today because somebody was praying for me. My mother was praying for me, my grandmother, my mother-in-law, my grandmother. People around me was just praying for me, and I'm grateful for that. And there are times that I've had to ask for prayers, and I just didn't know where else to turn. And God says, you have a church family right here in your midst that's willing to pray for you. If you have something on your heart today, do not leave this church with you. We have a separate prayer for you. The prayer of faith is so powerful. It can change the circumstances that you're in. Prayer changes things, it changes people, it changes seasons. Amen? Amen. Let's be safe. One can wash away my